Central District Board of Education meeting. Would you all please silence your cell phones and stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first on the agenda, we have public comment, and we have public comment in person and also via email, so I'll start with Rachel Riley. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Board of Ed this evening. As a community, we have spent a great deal of time, energy, and money bringing the Positivity Project to our students this school year. In a society that has become increasingly divisive and polarized, the importance of guiding our children down the paths of kindness, justice, and acceptance is vital to their futures and to the future of the world that they will someday lead. The P2 introductory letter that was shared with families last October points to 24 character strengths which serve as its foundation. Many of our teachers have been working hard to encourage and model these character strengths in their daily classroom interactions with our children. The following character strengths are part of the P2 lesson plan that is being taught to our youth. Perspective, social intelligence, kindness, fairness, open-mindedness, and self-control. Each of these values are incredibly beneficial to our community, both in and out of the school buildings. I find it very troubling, therefore, that the president of our Board of Ed has utilized a social media platform to belittle and name call those in our community who may not share her personal views. In a recent post, she shared information regarding the VA system and its initiatives relating to gender pronouns. Added to the VA information was the following, quote, we've had some local people angry that the school has informed kids about pronouns. And there, and in their view, that's indoctrination. Hashtag bigots take a hike. Calling members of the community bigots because they may not share the same views is unkind, unfair, and closed-minded. Each member of the Board of Ed, once elected, agreed to represent the entire Gilderland community. Our community will not always agree on every issue. And as we have seen in the recent past, not every member of our community will express their thoughts in a positive, productive, or appropriate manner. Nevertheless, our Board of Ed members have a responsibility to set a proper example for our children. We have chosen to invest the money and time necessary to address the social, social emotional health of our student body. Teachers are using their limited classroom time to share these valuable messages with our children and parents receive weekly emails encouraging them to continue the P2 discussions at home. I would therefore ask our elected representatives to look at their own behaviors and if necessary, make adjustments so that they exemplify the standards that we expect of our students and our staff. If one cannot lead by example, one should not lead at all. And I thank you for your time. Okay, I'll respond to that before we move on to the next public comment. Um, yes, I affirm the right to use for students to use pronouns, and I affirm the right for kids um, who are asking for that respect. Uh, so we'll move on to the next public comment. Do I have any other public comments in person? Linda? No? Okay. The next public comment is from Nadia Haralchek. She writes, Dear members of the Gilderland Board of Education, my name is Nadia Haralchek, and this year during the 21-22 sports season, I was on the Gilderland Junior Varsity Wrestling Team. I'm writing this letter to you to request the addition of a girls wrestling team for Gilderland High School. Although I've had an amazing experience with wrestling, it's a sport that isn't accessible to many girls. Girls may assume that they're not allowed to wrestle because it's listed as a boy sport, or they may encounter adults who discourage them from continuing, the latter of which happened to me on multiple occasions. The Gilderman coaches have always been very supportive of me. Coach Favreau was the one who originally welcomed me into the program when I did youth wrestling, and he has helped me with various techniques this year. 
Coach Bowl is my coach on JV wrestling and helped me do my best all season. Coach Barge is my coach on the modified team and he was always very supportive of me. Coach Huslander is the one who encouraged me to write this letter in the first place. In January, he took me and the other girl on the team to an all girls tournament that was held at Kiksaki Athens. This tournament was crucial to our success and it was a major confidence booster. That tournament was where I had my first win of the season with a pin in the third period. All of my four matches that day, I was cons consistently doing better, much better than I had been doing the rest of the season. Although Aniella, the other girl on the team, had some wins under her belt before that tournament, she won three out of the four matches she wrestled. When on a level playing field, we performed extremely well. Recently, I took part of the first ever girls folk style state championships in New York State and had an amazing experience. Gilderland girls are among the first in the state to compete in these events. And the next step is getting us our own team. Wrestling has been so important to me and I want other girls to be able to benefit from it as well. Wrestling has helped me meet some really cool people and it's helped me get in better shape too. Unfortunately, when girls have to wrestle boys, it's often not a very positive experience. I was very lucky this year to be able to wrestle another girl for the majority of the time at practice, but most girls don't have that same opportunity. I feel much more confident when I'm wrestling a girl. Although I know that girls will always have a place to wrestle in Gilderland, it's time for us to take the lead in this fastest growing sport in the country and support our girls just as much as we support the boys. Thank you for your consideration, Nadia Geraldine. I guess just to follow up on that, I know that there's a couple of districts. I know Niski Una has a girls wrestling team and I would like maybe Dave Austin to see how much interest there is so we can consider it because I don't, I don't follow wrestling boys or girls. Kind of like a unified team, like we do with the storm, where we got a couple schools that might have the same situation we have, where it's two or three or less girls. And it's one I, way to start. I, it's one way of starting out. One way to start out. Yeah. Right. Right. Build, yeah. I mean, the unified build. team. That's that's a great yeah. experience. The storm's a great experience. A good place. I mean, that's that's the way we might have to look. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess we just ask Dave. Okay. So you can follow up then, Dave Austin. I will. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Next on the agenda, we have the consent items. This includes the minutes of the March 29th meeting and April 5th, CPSC and CSC recommendations, uh, personnel action, and the financials. Can I have a motion to approve the consent items? Nate, second Blanca. Any questions or comments? No. All, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. Passes 9 0. Thank you. Next, we have information items, uh, superintendent information. Dr. Wild. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, uh, each year, the New York State Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance uh, Capital Zone selects members of the senior class and adapted physical education students who may be moving on from high school with a leadership award in physical education. This award recognizes students in the areas of leadership, scholastic achievement, physical performance, and service to the school and or community. So tonight we'd like to congratulate four students, uh, Joanna Chen, Mitchell McKissick, Samantha Morrissey, and Benjamin Palashi. Uh, more congratulations. We have some uh, Gilderland High School students who entered the multimedia contest of the Albany Tula Alliance. The topic for this year was discerning fact from fiction. The prompt students were given was, how can you form an unbiased opinion of another culture without being able to travel there. Mm -hmm. This contest was for all Capital Region High School students, including college freshmen, working individually or in small groups. 13 students in Ms. Curran's 10th grade English class finished strong, winning recognition and cash prizes. Uh, below is the list of winners. Uh, second place was Medina Arova, who is a group leader working with uh, Samartha Sagar. Third place went to Hazel Regan, Honorable mention went to Ashi Gadamsetti, who's a group leader, along with Sharon Francis and Suryana Nalamothu. Uh, also, Marian Abdelnor, Miranda Petorti, Connor Webb, who's a group leader, Ava Vitali, Jade Sun, Owen Cook, Erica Lavernus. So, congratulations to all of our students who entered that um, very interesting topic. I would like to read some of those. <laughs> Uh, projects. 
Uh, we also had some students who were recognized in the Capital Region Media Arts Festival. So we want to offer our congratulations to those students whose work was selected for the Capital Region Media Arts Festival, and in particular, two of our seniors, Camilla Armstrong, who earned second place for Emoji Self-Portrait, and Brian Govan for his film Frivolous Theft, which earned an overall outstanding film award. Other award winners were uh, Sevilla Biaco for Rude Awakening, Harper Wolf for The House, Sarah Shoemaker for Shiny Things, Emily Salisbury for Pretty Girl, Isabella Libby for Collection of Problems, Sydney Moffitt for Low Poly Self Portrait, Carter St. Dennis for Glitched Salvatore Mundi, uh, Tamjid Menon for Mirror Road, Catherine Krizik for Women of the Spirits, Alaya Famadou for Quantum Superposition, Camilla Armstrong for self-portrait, and Justin Garcia also for a self-portrait, Alina Khan also for a self-portrait, Jaden Smith also for a self-portrait, uh, animation class in 912 for morphs and walk cycles, and that included Ian Benedict, Liam Durkin, Cole Kaczynski, and Ashlyn Lather for follow my social. Summer uh, Lawfridge, Kylie Ocasio, Colin Shea, Savannah Plant for The Stairwell. And again, Brian Coven for The Frivolous Theft and Camilla Armstrong for Emoji Self-Portrait. So congratulations, everyone. And I just wanted to add as well, um, in the spirit of art, today was the first elementary art show in three years at the Gilderland Public Library. And what I am um, overwhelmed by is the amount of talent we have among our school community as artists and the passion and the inspiration of their teachers. I think we um, had the most people in Gilderland Public Ever. Library at one Ever. time in three years. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna get a talking to when I get home tonight or what. Um, but the parking lot is twice as big and it was still impossible to find a place to park. Yep. So to all of our artists and the teachers who inspire them, thank you and congratulations. A tougher topic, however, <laughs> moving right along, um, is just a brief update on our school start time work. Um, we have the task force that has been uh, pulled back together again. We've been meeting on Thursdays. Our most recent meeting was last Thursday, and we spent uh, our hour and a half together looking at three models for start times for the fall and the um, the distinguishing feature of the three models is that at least from a transportation perspective they would be doable so we decided to focus in on what we can actually accomplish given our geography and our traffic and the number of drivers that we have um, and then each of those models we talked about the pros and the cons and all of the models had pros and all of the models <laughs> had cons. Um, the third model had the, um, the first model had the high school, uh, elementary school starting first, which is, a, it was a variation on what we're doing right now. The second model had um, the high school going first, so it reverted back to an earlier start time. The third model, which we rejected by the end of the meeting, had the elementary schools uh, starting last. Uh, their start time, I'm not even going to say what time it was, it was <laughs> very late. Um, so at the conclusion of the meeting, we had a, a suggestion to mock up a model where the middle school went last, and also to explore uh, a variation on the elementary first model where the elementary started just a little bit earlier. Because um, one of the significant trade-offs of the models is lost instructional time, and depending on who goes in the middle, Whoever's in the middle needs to look at shortening their instructional day. Um, we don't meet again on the Thursday of this week for obvious reasons, and even more obvious, we're not meeting next Thursday, but we are meeting the Monday after break. Um, and the hope is to bring some uh, concrete recommendation or recommendations to the Board of Education. And we'll do a presentation um, in early May to the board to see, so the whole board can see kind of what we're working on. But the work, continues. I know uh, Rebecca and Barbara sit on those meetings and I don't know if I missed anything or if you want to add anything. 
I'll just add, there really is no perfect solution. There's <laughs> many, many people looking at this, and there doesn't seem to be any, you know, miracle. It's going to be Winning all pros lottery, and no cons. Buses would be a miracle. <laughs> yeah. We'd have to win and the lottery bus and clone bus drivers. <laughs> yes, uh, we help. have the number of buses. We're good. <laughs> okay, just need drivers. <laughs> no one to drive them. <laughs> Can I just make a comment on it? Sure. It does make me a little nervous um, cutting down on any instructional time. Mm -hmm. I know there's not a, a good choice, but it, it that just kind of makes me nervous. They're really cut close as it is. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone shares that feeling, <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Just a, a little follow-up. One of the things that it is a bit of a problem is the the whole capital region isn't on the same start time. And one of the things that I think I brought up was that um, a number of states, as a state policy, uh, California being one, I guess New Jersey's potentially going in that direction is mandating that you know schools uh, high schools don't start any earlier than 830 and that would alleviate some of the the busing challenges that we have with getting kids to BOCES and you know other other districts um, and one of the things that we did many many years ago this goes way back uh, as a board we um, had the state School Boards Association uh, put up a policy proposal on their floor uh, suggesting that they lobby the state. But at that time, um, we made it as mild as we could in the sense that it wouldn't be a mandate, but there'd be some kind of an encouraging, you know, a blue ribbon school or orange school or whatever a designation. But in light that a number of states um, are actually trying to make this a law, would we as a board want to make a similar proposal to NISBA or suggest that um, there is a, a, a bill that I haven't seen yet that's in our legislature right now uh, that is also recommending, you know, a late school, school start, mainly because the scientific evidence is so strong that this is so beneficial to kids. And um, I just throw that out that we certainly have the opportunity to, to do that if we wanted to. Okay, yeah, that would make me, at the 8.30 time when you said that makes me a little skittish only because we're supposed to be making our students like ready for after they graduate. And we have some students that are, are gonna go on to college who will have an 8 a.m. class and like we need to get them ready and I just speaking from me as a, a parent of two high school students right now they're not saving any sleep they're going to bed later and it's still like I I, I would not be in favor at all of start of doing that not at all yeah. and also when you look at the, um, the survey results you got back a number of teachers especially middle school teachers and having been there I know what they mean you know it's so late in the day you've lost the kids I mean that last hour and a half you just all your energy is just to get their attention and they're they're done uh, so I'm not thrilled about what you know I, I know what the scientific research shows about high school kids but I'm thinking of those kids in the middle too yeah. who often get squeezed in squeezed sports out. and extracurriculars exactly it just it pushes it it's pushes a lot. everything later and later so I think about this a lot. I'm sure that comes as a surprise. Um, but you know, our students are with us for 13 years. And um, as a, the student journey will include going first, second, and third in the, in the lineup. Um, so when I think about it that way, it's like as a student, I never get the earliest spot for all 13 years or the middle spot or the late spot for all 13 years. And when I thought about it that way, it, it starts to help me think about, so what makes the most sense on that journey? And I don't have the answer to it yet, but I just think that that's an Im important twist on the conversation, that it's not forever for any grade level. But we need to also honor the, the research for all levels, that what it shows in terms of best learning conditions. Mm -hmm. And there's been, you know, since the 70s, a lot of attention given on how middle school kids learn and what's the best kind of 
learning environments. I think we need to all emphasize all three. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely I, I yeah. know you do. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm so sorry about from Minnesota that piloted this many, many years ago, um, California that it's been in effect. And I mean, their college students are still going to college and you know, that type of thing. But overwhelmingly, um, I, I think um, Glens Falls, you know, preceded us trying to do this this year. And ag again, originally the kids were a little bit leery about it, but when they were questioned after they had actually experienced it, uh, they were overwhelmingly positive for it. Um, you know, we could even have another follow-up from the gentleman from up there that made the presentation to us a number of years ago. The huge difference is that they don't transport their kids. That's, right. That's our... Right, right. Plus, if you're only focusing on the survey or looking at the results for that one level, but you have to look at what is it doing across the district? How is everyone affected? Yes, I agree. Sure, high school kids, it's better for them. But what is it doing? Where, is the, where do we find the balance for each level? That's what we have to think about. Well, one of the things that was, was brought up by Mike Laster is that the middle school does have more teaching minutes than are required. And so if, if we had to shrink some time, that would probably be an easier fix than the, the elementary or the high school level. But I, again, it, it's a tough problem and they're working on it and we'll see what happens. I think it underscores that there's no, good, there's no easy solution. Yeah. Yeah. There's no one's there's gonna be no happy solution. Like with everything. Well, I have my last item, which I'm pretty sure everyone will be happy with. <laughs> and this is about school recess on May 27th, 2022. And if the district does not experience any more than one emergency closing situation prior to Memorial Weekend, all Gilderland Central School Districts will be closed on Friday, May 27th due to unused snow emergency days allocated as part of the 2021-2022 school year calendar. This was listed on the calendar as a contingent holiday, and all district and school offices will be closed on that day. That means we can, we can have one more day. <laughs> no, we don't want more. For whatever purpose, but hopefully we will not need that, and we can all enjoy an extra long weekend. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wiley. Uh, next, we have board president information. Um, we have four items here. First is voter registration. Um, I'll read this. So we the public vote on the school budget and board of, Elect board of education will be held on Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. Voter registration is required at the in the Gilman School District. To vote, you must be 18 years old, a U.S. citizen, and a resident of the Gilman School District for at least 30 days prior to the vote. If you are not registered with the school district or the Albany County Board of Elections, you must do so prior to the vote. You may register with the Albany County Board of Elections, and there's a link on the agenda, or through the DMV, and there's also a link on the agenda. The district has established three registration dates for residents to vote at the May 17th budget vote and election. You may register anytime between 8.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. at one of the elementary schools, or from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the district office on the following dates, Thursday, May 5th, Monday, May 9th, or Tuesday, May 10th. If you are not sure at which elementary school to vote, please refer to our web page link, Budget and Taxes, and use the link that drops down voter eligibility and absentee ballots. You can see if you're registered and where you vote for school elections. The next item has to do with the upcoming Board of uh, Education election. Uh, petitions are available through the district clerk for any district resident who may be considering running for of eligible district voters are required based on the 2% of those voting in last year's election. There are three three-year terms and one one-year term on the board that will begin July 1st, 2022. In order to be eligible to run for the Board of Ed nominating petitions with 52 or more signatures from qualified voters in the district, 
must be submitted to the district clerk on or before April 18th by 5 p.m. Anyone who has questions about the duties and responsibilities of a board member may contact the superintendent, board president, or any current member of the Board of Ed. A candidate must be able to read and write, be at least 18 years of age, a qualified voter, and a district resident for at least one year prior to the vote, the date of the vote on Tuesday, May 17th. Further qualifications and information is in the packet available through the district clerk. The next item is the Capital Region BOCES uh, budget and board election vote that will take place on Wednesday, April 27th. There are four seats up for election. This is the date of our special board meeting that takes place at 8 a.m. So I think we'll do that again virtually. To, can we vote virtually for that? Yes. Um, at 8 a.m. So okay. you have that on your calendar. And lastly, the DEI co uh, committee call for new members. The Board of Ed is seeking letters of interest from school community stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, parents, community members to be considered for membership on the newly established DEI committee. Okay, next on the agenda, we have action item school business. Neil? Yes, this one item is it's a recommendation to approve a general fund transfer um, of $24,250. Can I have a motion to approve the transfer? Rebecca, second Kelly. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Passes 9 0. Thank you, Neil. Next, Superintendent Action, Dr. Wells. Uh, my first item is an agreement that reads, be it resolved that the Board of Education authorizes the Superintendent of Schools, Marie Wiles, to execute the proposed agreement between the Gilderland Central School District and Naomi Chris. Can I have a motion to approve the agreement? Nate, second, Gloria. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Passes 9-0. Okay, my next item is the adoption of the 2022-2023 school budget. Um, as you know, earlier this week, um, the state was able to finalize the state budget and we were able to get some updated aid runs uh, that we were able to incorporate into our plan that we discussed last, um, last Tuesday when we were together for our workshop. Uh, Mr. Sanders has put together a, a worksheet for the board to contemplate the changes that we've seen since the adoption of the state budget. So I'm going to turn things over to you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, we do have revisions, even though it was a week ago. Um, this relates to information that we file with the state regarding expenditures, planned expenditures. So as you know, we have a capital construction project going on. One of the things that we do have associated with, with that is going to be debt, and then with debt, we get aid back from the state as part of that process. We have to supply information to the state on when we anticipate having those expenses and in turn the state aiding those expenses. So there's certain time frames where we have to indicate we're about to have a borrowing, that borrowing is gonna occur in a certain fiscal year, and then the state has the information to make um, the adjustment on their end in terms of the payment of state aid. So we made a late decision prior to the superintendent's budget release of whether we could get our projects finished in time and the paperwork in on time to get aided this school year. Um, as you know, with supply chain issues and material delivery issues, our project has dragged out farther than, longer than we thought for the first phase of our construction for the 2019 proposition. We were concerned that we would not be able to complete everything that we needed to do to make that commitment to the state that we're ready to, to receive aid um, to have everything in place so if, if that weren't the case we would have had expenditures without aid so we took the safer route and said we'll we'll put it off a year that means delaying the submission of information to the state and they will take it off the record so in the January run the executive budget run that aid was not shown anticipating the finalization of the projects from from 2019, or was shown, excuse me. Uh, in the state had planned on, on uh, providing that money. Now we have a change of plans. Um, on the new state aid run, they've taken that money away, as they should, because they're not going to spend it, so our aid got reduced. We should have caught that and made that adjustment and notified you sooner of that, so for that I apologize. Um, what this means though is that we do have to make some adjustments to the budget from what was presented last week 
So I'll just walk through those. Uh, basically, in terms of state aid, it's uh, $308,000 that we are now need to cover that we had anticipated in, in revenue that we're not going to receive for next year. We have some offsets to that on the expenditure side uh, to be able to get the, balance, the budget back in balance. Uh, so looking at some of the needs that we have in the identified in the budget, we have uh, custodial equipment, $64,330 that we can utilize federal funds for. These are vacuums, uh, floor scrubbing machines, so the health and safety type of items that we replace on a regular basis. Uh, elementary furniture and equipment, so we allocate money each year to replace cafeteria tables, student chairs, desks, uh, those sorts of things. So that's for all five elementary schools. We can put that against federal funds. Uh, also, replacement music equipment. So we're planning to, to do that. We're doing some of that already, uh, so we will shift that money over to the federal funds. Also, since April 1st has passed, we now know who is requesting transportation for the next school year, because all the transportation requests had to be filed. So looking at that, we had six schools that we were transporting to, six runs that we had contracted for to, to private schools in the current year that we're not going to be transporting to next year. We do have three other schools that we are, that we currently don't do, or two other schools that um, are going to require transportation we don't currently don't transport to. The net effect of that is um, a reduction of just about just shy of sixty thousand um, dollars for that change. And then, uh, and and again, um, we'll be able to realize some savings there. And then special ed private placements. We've talked about this quite a bit. We had um, quite a few an enrollment increase in our special education program, larger than normal. Uh, as time has gone on, we've been able to look at those students closer and closer and decide on placements. We had projected three students to be in private placements. Uh, Lisa Knowles has told me we can bring them in-house in to our existing programs at no additional cost, so that saves us hundred or another $135,000. So in short, we have budget adjustments. We're almost back to the same spot as where we were before in terms of our tax levy increase being still at 2.98%. Our budget is, is lower, it's 4.68%, the budget to budget increase. Uh, but those changes really kind of bring us uh, back in line. The other thing I should mention is that we would have ended up in this same spot if we had done this two weeks ago. We still have the same situation where the aid reduction occurred and we would have had to make adjustments in the budget. So again, it's not that we're, we wouldn't have not landed in the same situation, but again, I apologize for being at this point in, in the process and, and bringing this to your attention. Um, and I did notice one other change in the resolution. We need to change the amount of the budget to 109 million eight eight seven eight four five. So when that gets voted on, we need to to make that adjustment it's at the prior number. Is there any questions? The state aid was reduced by that 308-921. Yes. And everything under that line where it says custodial equipment, so all of that is basically balancing out and brings us back to correct. neutral bring from the last worksheet? Yes, that's correct. Would the, I mean, I'm just curious. If everything under there, would we find this money for other things if this hadn't happened? Well, we would have still been in the same place. I mean, we, we okay. still would have... Um, not had that aid coming in a regard it's it's a timing issue okay. so right. we if i would have told you at the last meeting right. that we had the situation without the aid as as well so um and then a plan for how to address that so thank you so we're um, a little bit less than what we had said last time uh t um on the tax levy increase we're exactly the same we're a little bit less budget to budget oh okay okay Yes, Kim. Yeah, I'm definitely glad that we were able to make that up. That that's great. But um, just kind of maybe bouncing a little off of what Seema said, I I'm a little concerned because we've asked for certain things and it, we're told that there's no wiggle room, and now all of a sudden we're able to find that. So 
I, I, and I understand they're the federal funds, but we've also been told over and over that it's still tight. So I, I would not feel comfortable if I didn't say something because I understand it was it was an oversight. We weren't told, but I mean we're supposed to make we have a fiduciary responsibility as board members. So I'm just a little getting this today and looking at everything and seeing that here's money, but we sat through two budget workshops where we were consistently told there was no wiggle room. I'm just concerned. Certainly understand. But I, th I think part of it too, um, well we might have found out April 1st, but that's not that much time like, like the being able to bring the students back wasn't found out. And there was another, oh, the transportation to the private schools couldn't come until April 1st. So that April 5th, which was I think our last meeting, um, we might have had some knowledge of that, but those were things that we weren't expecting, you know. So, oh, no, I, I yeah. definitely understand that. But yet at the same time, we weren't expecting them. There are things that we expect that our, our principals have asked for that we're told there's no wiggle room. But yet we thankfully found the money for this. So I guess that's my concern. It's like it's mm -hmm. not looking good. Like last meeting we found money for the librarian. This week we found the three over 300000 to cover. Mm -hmm. It's starting to look like a pattern. So I'm just... Like, mm -hmm. it, and I know this sounds awful. It's just I'm not comfortable with it. Well, I I disagree. I could I can see why it's coming like that. Did you say you're taking it from the federal budget? So federal funds, yes. So it just means that we business. won't have that money at the end of the. So we're just pre we're getting the federal taking more out of the federal funds than we anticipated this year. Well, we have um, we've identified certain expenses out of the federal funds, we still have remaining federal funds. Uh, they extend for another two years. We explained that at, at the last meeting. Uh, there's still a rollout here, so. Um, but there that is just means we won't be able to use those $300,000 in years two, three, and four? Uh, it's it's less than that. It's just, it's those uh, okay. top three items, so it's so close to 100000 If I understand it right, we're just using it up a little bit earlier than we would normally have? Does that make sense? It, Is that no, right? And, and I, I do understand that, but we've, it, I've brought it up numerous times. We have six bubbles right now at our elementary school. These are our students that started COVID that are losing, that they have lost instruction time, they are struggling, and that should have gone, like we should have used federal funds even for that to make sure that they're not scraping and trying to, to find this. And I know that we're within the parameters of the class sizes, but our, our thought exchange shows that our families are looking for smaller class sizes. We have federal funds that are supposed to go towards COVID-related things. It's COVID-related that these kids missed out, that they, they, were, they were virtual for almost two years. So I guess that's, I understand that it's not necessarily found money, but I guess I'm just, it, I'm glad we can cover it because then it's not a hit, but at the same time, I don't like how it's being chosen, like this over that. Like these are, of course we need the equipment and things like that, but we also have students who were literally virtual in kindergarten, in first grade, and then didn't have a full second grade year. And we have other students that, I mean, that's my concern, I guess, with this. Sam? Go ahead, Barb. Uh, I guess I have another concern that we aren't fulfilling our obligation, or at least if the information that, that Kim provided to us uh, over the last day or so uh, with our FTEs for our special ed population, that apparently we have identified currently uh, certain FTEs that are required, required under, you know, the IEPs to service the kids and each summer we s seem to in inherit a number of families that perhaps might have um, certain needs and I was just hoping that we could use some of those federal funds or maybe we are to fulfill those FTEs um, that we already know are mandated by IEPs for the upcoming year and I'm just worried that by not budgeting for that, where is that money going to come 
or are those kids going to be shortchanged? And I know we can't shortchange them by law. So maybe you can explain the balance there, why, why all those FTEs are not covered in our budget. Are you referring to ENL, Barbara? Not the ENL, <coughs> the, um, this, the spreadsheet that, that, that Kim shared with us from the different schools that had um, certain needs for their special ed population. No, this, the, if you're talking about the email that I sent the other day, like with the FTEs, that was that for was the ENL. ENL. Just the ENL. That was just the yeah, ENL. That was just for the <coughs> ENL. And that one's covered by federal funds. So just to clarify, um, we had a request for 1.8 FTEs and ENL. All of those are covered in the, um, will be covered through federal, the federal funds. And one of the reasons why that makes sense is that during the COVID period, we've had fewer students who either took the nice slat, which is the test that you test out of or move along the continuum in ENL. So we think we have a backlog of students who will test out over time. So we can use for uh, you know the two years our federal funds to provide those additional FTEs in order to make those um, in, in order to serve those students. So the the other question that um, came up was, is that 1.8 across I think it's Linwood, Pine Bush, the high school, and Altima? Is that enough? Um, we're continuing to evaluate our students right now. If, in fact, it turns out we need to add a, a portion of an FTE, we, we do have the federal resources to do it. Um, but so much of the work that we do here is that with every week that passes, we have better and better data about actual needs, actual costs, um, so we can fine tune as we go along. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention, and Barbara, this is re in response to a question you asked last week when we were doing an update on the federal funds, and I think this will be helpful for our community. What we're working on putting together is a kind of a master chart of our federal funds, what we've spent this year, 21-22, which of those things will carry forward to 22-23 and which won't, and then what's new for 22-23 and what will carry forward into uh, 23, 24, when that funding runs out. So we're working on that, and we're hoping to be able to present that to you, and not too far down the road. But it's a project to sort that out, and I'm, yes, it's a project. I think that would be helpful mm -hmm. to see that mm -hmm. where it sunsets, where the I money guess sunsets. Mm -hmm. The other question I wanted to ask: the musical instruments, that will still be funded, right? But it'll be funded with the federal funds rather than our internal monies. An allocation in the federal funds for okay. that already. We, we cut that a few years ago, reduced that by about $10,000 in the budget. So this gets us back on track to start working our way back up to a regular replacement, music equipment replacement program. Just a general question. So is this a type of situation where if we don't, we have to return anything we don't use, right, for the federal funds, correct? Yes. Right. So. I, I guess I'm just getting nervous like we're not using it. So we're not gonna let that happen, right? Where we lose <laughs> no, we're not. federal funds. <laughs> okay. Don't job. worry. <laughs> okay. Just confirming. Option to match the number that's in Neil's worksheet of 109 million dollars Second. Okay, all in favor? Mm -hmm. It passes 9 0. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so do, you, do we need a roll call vote? 
So there's one more step to this. Um, after adopting the budget for 109 million, now that the board will need to adopt our property tax report card for 22-23. And it, the resolution is resolved that the Board of Education approve the 2022-2023 property tax report card for submission to New York State Education Department based on the adopted budget. Can I have a motion to accept the tax report card? So uh, moved. Judy, second Kelly. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes nine zero. And thank you, Dr. Wiles. Next, we have board committee reports. We'll start with audit. <coughs> <coughs> So we oh, yes. Nope. Uh, May 4th is our next meeting. We haven't had one since our last mm -hmm. meeting. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, uh, business practices? We have had a meeting and don't have one scheduled, I don't think. Okay. And communications? We met. <laughs> Uh, we met on April 6th. We had a couple of items on our agenda. The first was the uh, budget communica the communication uh, on the budget. <coughs> we discussed strategies for communicating about the budget to the, uh, to the public at large for the 22-23 budget. Uh, as in recent years, we will be producing an oversized postcard to share information about the budget rather than that multi-page newsletter which we did years ago. The card will direct readers to the website for more detailed information about any piece of the budget if they wish to dig a little deeper. Um, we discussed some ideas uh, from the committee that we might want to include as we, as we approach uh, communicating with the, uh, with the public. We, we advised to maybe have two or three main points that we stress about the budget as the primary focus. Maybe things like the fact that this budget does maintain programming that we have developed over the course of years. Uh, that it also improves our class size reduction, especially at the middle school, grade eight. Uh, that it expands the uh, library position at uh, Altamont Elementary School. And that it has shows many, many connections to our mission and our goals. So we, we advise that the uh, postcard we send out kind of keeps to those ideas. We reference federal funds, and that's where we came up with the idea of maybe, and Marie suggested about doing the chart. Uh, to give people a very clear picture. You know, you hear this term federal funds and it's kind of amorphous out there. So we thought we'd make it more concrete and real. Uh, and Marie suggested putting together this chart, which would be very helpful, I think. Um, the more ex there will be a more extensive newsletter coming out uh, very soon in our, in our mailboxes. It will include many stories about the district, including the arts, athletics, positivity project. Uh, and community service, so it'll give people a full picture of what, what the district has been involved in and our kids have been doing. Uh, there will be many photos of student engagements. The uh, committee also looked at the handbook, section three, uh, and we hope to have one more meeting on the handbook, and then we'll come back to the board with all the proposed changes. They're, they're not many, but just some suggestions for wording. Uh, we reviewed this time uh, section three, and uh, we, we had some suggested changes. Uh, referencing some of the wording. Uh, there's a section on orienting new members, and we just suggested that uh, we take a look closely at what the district office outline is that they use for new board members when they kind of orient them to coming onto the board to make sure that, that their list agrees with the handbook list. Um, and we, the last thing we talked about was the self-evaluation. It's been a couple of years since we, as a board, have done a full evaluation of ourselves and how we're doing. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we brought in a private consultant, and several years ago, Jay Warona, who is the NISBA lawyer, and he also lives in the district and has been very supportive of our district, he helped us do an evaluation one year as well. That was 2020. Uh, each, each person we brought in had a, a self-evaluation tool that they had us fill out, and then we all came together and reviewed the results to see how we were doing. So we discussed whether or not the board needs to do that. It's been a few years now. Um, so one thing we decided, since we were kind of split, there was a couple of different kind of opinions, we decided to come to the full board for a discussion about wh how we felt about that. Um, my feeling was that I know time is always a big issue about when you do things, but we, we are gonna be scheduling a goal setting 
evening that maybe we could use part of that if we if we identify a tool early get that out people report it we bring it back and then we use part of that meeting divided maybe into two parts goal setting and then taking a look at how we've done based on a, a tool that perhaps we can agree on beforehand or we punt and push it off <laughs> another year which we've been putting off uh, so I'm open for suggestions or comments or thoughts reflections well I mean time-wise I think it would make sense to put them together but I don't know if you're trying to avoid the word retreat but <laughs> I'm just wondering if if they're put together can it be that you know there's only that one situation where the board can meet outside of an open meeting and that would be for goals I mean we've done this before where it's a evaluation slash retreat mm -hmm. would that could that be included in that I think so well, the goal setting would be public, but right. the review of the evaluation does not need to be public. Okay. So it could be yeah, like two we, parts. Yeah. To the meeting rather than having two separate days. If people feel, you know, do, do we feel like we want to reflect on how we've been doing? And yeah, Anna, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> so Gloria knows what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> I'm okay. open to that. I think that's actually a really good idea to do it with the goal setting. I just think it's a lot of self reflection. So we do self reflection <laughs> after every meeting. And then we're going to do this other self-reflection. It just seems a little bit insular. Um, and so maybe we could limit some of the self-reflection. Well, I think, I, well, I think the tool that we use is going to be important because I think the one we do after the meeting is very specific. How do we do tonight? You know, and if we see anything coming up, we get a heads up early mm -hmm. and we can address it. But something like this is more, the, the questions I think would be broader to, to get a, you know, a broad look at how we've done Maybe about feeling of our goals, how we've met met those goals or not, and how we've worked as a team. You know, not just specific to a night, but I, I think that personally, in my opinion, that makes a lot of sense. I think we should maybe think about shelving the every board meeting self reflection. Oh, well, we could talk about that yeah. at the at mm -hmm. the evaluation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could we'll be we'll one of the reflect on our reflections. <laughs> on our reflections. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I, and and Rebecca and I have had this conversation yeah. about you know my personal feeling is that I think having been on the board a while we're lucky we're very fortunate we haven't had big issues that have come up but you know nine people working together we're all very different we can clash in different ways and i think it's healthy to catch those things early when they can be worked out rather than them building or seething and sitting there and, you know mm -hmm. so that's just my take on it too but i think it totally makes sense I, I you have a lot more experience in this than i do so i, I respect your opinion but i also don't want to over overkill i i respect that too <laughs> But if we can work it out that an evening is kind of broken up into a public session where we do the, the envisioning and then a, a private time where we reflect yeah. on ourselves. I mean, I'm in support of that. I, I would think that it would be better to do it after. I think we're in agreement after the election. Yeah. And vote. Yes. Blanca, did you have a comment? I guess I could save it for the reflection period, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I'll just really quickly. One of the things that um, I sort of question is, we have the opportunity to to say if something has made us feel uncomfortable or if we disagree but then nobody owns it so it sort of just like hangs out there so if if somebody feels offended enough to write that they disagree that we didn't meet one of our goals during a meeting and then we don't talk about it then how can we fix it and how can we right. actually improve so just like want to leave that out there right so i think that's, that's definitely a good, good topic for that mm -hmm. thing, so and um, would would it be would the board feel that you'd leave it to the communications committee to identify a tool that we might use sure. about do we need a third party to come in and do that or can we it's okay. not going to cost anything right when you've brought in a third party has it ever cost it does it is no. there a cost no, no. Okay. no. yes it does yes. Yeah. well <laughs> with, with who, uh, one person works. anybody works for free but I, I think um, school yeah. boards had a charge oh they did I think okay. so I'm I don't think, I think we, we need can do to we, can, we have there are enough tools out there I think that we okay. can identify some <coughs> I mean, we're not doing a full blown retreat, so I think that, that would be fun. I don't think we need to bring in an additional person to no. reflect on our reflecting <laughs> of, on ourselves. <laughs> but I do wish that we do, if somebody does um, say they don't agree with one of those things, they should identify themselves because we never talk about it and if you look at well, the we past we haven't had any really no if you look at the past three or four weeks there's been somebody that says something well, and we're person. all kind of like oh they somebody thought something but we never actually talked about it Where'd so from? Yeah. I send an email send a bring it up in executive whatever you feel like well, you need I to do mm -hmm. I asked, um, 
Did I send an email? Maybe I haven't week? been yeah. debriefed yeah. on Yes, you did. So. You did. Great. Um, but so. yeah, this sounds like a great topic for that mm -hmm. piece. So we can talk, figure out some dates after the sure. vote. Yeah, and uh, we will be meeting again on May 31st. Thank you. Uh, DEI? Um, we haven't had a meeting, so our next meeting is April 27th. Thank you. And then last and policy. We have a meeting in May, right? Uh, we're meeting on May 4th. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have uh, public comment number two. Linda, are there any more public comments? Thank you. Uh, next, board issues, ideas, and sharing. Gloria? I just wanted to amplify what Marie said in the beginning about that elementary school, uh, the elementary art, art program. Kim, I, I ran into Kim there as well. So, All I found myself doing was walking around with a smile on my face. These kids were like so jumping out of their skin, you know, showing their stuff to their grandparents and their parents, and the parents or grandparents are posing them, pointing to their piece. And, and I looked at some and I thought, I could never do that. And it was a kindergartner. <laughs> Kindergartner. I said, there's no way on earth a kindergartner did these little ceramic things. So I, my hat's <laughs> off to the art, and that's the art people in this district because that's still it was phenomenal. Li it's there for and it's going to be there for a while. And if you get a chance, okay. if you want to put a smile on your face, go walk through that. Room. Yeah. Okay. Any other board issues like you and sharing? Um, I do. Go ahead, Blanca. I was part of the FMS PTA meeting, and there was an update on the moving up pay. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody who donated because we had to actually ask for donations in order to fund the Moving Up Day celebration. And additionally, I know I had brought up the idea of a dance. Um, it seems like the plan for the Moving Up Day actually negates that need for the dance. It sounds like it's going to be, um, you know, multi-dimensional this celebration, and it's going to be like a dance and other things involved. So, anyway, uh, kudos to those who planned the Moving Up Day celebration. Any other issues, ideas, and sharing? Okay, then can I have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Kelly, second Rebecca, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passes by zero. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>